welcome back to the Trauma Therapist Podcast. My name is Guy McPherson. My mission is to help trauma therapists be their incredible selves, to be human, to be real, not just a clinician. I'm a big believer in who we are is more important than what we know. And this requires cultivating authenticity, genuineness, and vulnerability, and that requires intention. You can learn more about my courses and workshops by going to the traumatherapistproject.com. That's the traumatherapistproject.com. Let's get started. Five, four, three, two, and one. Our folks, welcome back to the podcast. Very excited to have back Dr. Leslie Ellis. Leslie, welcome back. Thank you. I'm really happy to be back. Awesome. Awesome. So Dr. Leslie Ellis is a leading expert in the use of somatic approaches in psychotherapy, in particular for working with dreams, nightmares, and the effects of trauma. She's the author of A Clinician's Guide to Dream Therapy, published by Rutledge in 2019, and offers many training opportunities and embodied experiential dream work based on her book. She's a PhD in clinical psychology from the Chicago School of Professional Psychology with a specialization in somatic approaches. Her dissertation on using focusing-oriented therapy to treat PTSD for refugees with recurrent nightmares won the Ernest Hartman Award from the International Association for the Study of Dreams. I mean, that's pretty cool. We'll talk about that, but welcome back. Thank you. Thank you so much. So uh, before we get to dive in here, share with the listeners again who, um, if they didn't hear you initially on episode 446, where you're from originally and where you are currently. I'm originally, well, I was born in Moose Jaw, Saskatchewan, but I'm an Air Force brat. So I had no fixed address basically growing up. Um, And right now I divide my time between Salt Spring Island, where we just moved. And um, in the winter, I spend quite a bit of time in Palm Desert. And what were we talking about here? Is that Canada? Where's Salt Um, Spring? Salt Spring is in Canada. It's the southernmost Gulf Island. So the San Juan Islands. Okay. Okay. And just quickly, so your, your, your dissertation, that's pretty cool. The one award, how that, how does that happen? (laughs) Well, the um, International Association for the Study of Dreams likes to promote uh, dream research and student research. And so they have a, um, uh, every year at their conference, they invite people to share their, their dissertations. And mine was the winner of the year I, I sent it in and, I think it was partly just, you know, because it was so, for me anyway, it was a, it was a really, uh, hmm, I don't know, I wouldn't say universally positive. I was about to say really positive, but it had everything in it because being doing a PhD is really an exercise in perseverance and it had its, um, pro, you know, sort of smooth parts and very difficult parts. But what I got from it has actually propelled my, my research and my thinking and my teaching ever since because mm-hmm. The um, I just applied this uh, focusing oriented embodied approach to working with dreams to people, refugees that had very severe uh, PTSD and uh, frequent nightmares. And it was a small study, but it just it, it was just very promising. It really showed how effective this kind of treatment can be. Some people had completely stopped having nightmares after decades. And the feedback I got from the participants was that they just felt empowered and they didn't really have a sense of control over their dreams before that. And so it really encouraged me to just keep going with um, developing the treatment and learning more about how I could help and staying on top of the research and teach and teaching clinicians. And it's really uh, evolved and it's become really um, main, my main focus right now, I would say. How did you get, <coughs> excuse me, how did you get involved or interested in uh dreams and nightmares usually we we hear dreams we don't mm-hmm. hear night so much about nightmares but how, what, how did how did that start for you i've always been interested in dreams you know it's like uh, i've just i'm a big daydreamer i really just like that sort of um realm that's like um between waking and sleeping and the the fantasy world i just i just kind of enjoy that that um that space that that mental space i think it's really generative and So, and then when I did my master's in counseling, when I wanted to become a therapist, I chose Pacifica Graduate Institute. And it's one of the 
few places really where you study dream work as part of your training. And I know, I know now that most uh, clinical programs don't include dream work as part of the Mm -hmm. training. And so it was, it was a, it was a pretty big part of my learning to become a therapist was working with dreams. And then I always use them in my practice. And so, yeah, I just kind of started right from the beginning of my training with working with dreams and I couldn't imagine not doing it. I didn't realize, I think at the time that it wasn't a mainstream, uh, real uh, mainstream tool anymore that a lot of programs have phased out dream work. And, um, I'm trying to change that. I'm trying to bring me in more training for people because I feel like it's such a window into Mm -hmm. what matters to people, but then nightmares specifically, it's not because I have a lot of nightmares. I really don't. Although my most profound dreams have been nightmares, it's that when I was looking for a dissertation topic, I wanted to do something related to dreams, but I wanted it to be something that clinical and uh, really the only uh, dream related subject that's got a clinical diagnosis is PTSD or nightmare disorder. So I wanted to basically see if I could incorporate something clinical into and compare, combine my interest in dreams and, and, uh, work toward, you know, maybe developing a different kind of treatment. So give us the, the, the kind of the overall uh, view of dreams clinically. Um, Cause correct me if I'm wrong here. They're like, there are a couple of camps, right? I mean, like, well, dreams are, why study them? They're the kind of like the the trash bin of you know our psyche in a sense. And then, um, right, the other there's another perspective. I don't know if it's it's just the the only other one is that it is a rich, fertile ground. Whoop. <laughs> Help us understand. <laughs> well, that is a big question. Yeah. Um, hmm. Well, I could. I always like to point out that dream work and dream, um, you know, dream therapy was how the whole enterprise of therapy started with Freud and Jung, and that dream work was at the beginning central to the pra- the practice of psychotherapy. And what I think has happened uh, over. Um, well, it's been a hundred years, I guess, is that there's been just a shift toward more um, evidence-based, cognitive, measurable, um, time-limited approaches to therapy. And dream work is not that. It's really unique, um, the, the path that people would take. It's perceived as really complicated and esoteric. And so um, there are more than two camps. There's not just the, oh, I think dreams are great uh, to, to, to use as a tool and, or they're not. But you could, you could, you know, you could, I guess, look at it that way if you want to m- draw it along a simple line. But um, even some people who work with, say, cognitive approaches will use dreams as a way to understand people's beliefs about about the world and how they're reflected in dreams i it's hard to generalize (laughs) this is a tough question but i would say the people that truly value dreams really are um in some way interested in depth in interested in the um information that's implicit or that we repress and that the the part of um you know that the therapist can do that would be most helpful is is to um, support the person in understanding and unearthing those things that live under the surface Mm -hmm. and so the the subterranean realm and 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 feeling like that's really important versus someone who might say you know i just want to know what you think and what you believe and we can work at a cognitive level and we'll get we'll get the job done so i think that might be the the two the two camps is how i might describe them i uh i think i may have shared this with you before but there was a point when I was uh, seeing a therapist who was uh, Jungian inspired and we did a lot of dream work and it was intense. I mean, I found myself, I'm sure this is not surprising to you, but you know, the more I tried to remember my dreams, the more I remembered my dreams and I was writing down my dreams and they were so, um, what abstract and and you know it, they they weren't very literal. 
I don't know where I'm going with this, but I, I kind of want to get to a point where you can share with us an experience of, of working with someone and, and what you learned or what was able to be uh, called from their dreams. How, how does, how does looking at our dreams help us? Mm -hmm. Well, um, <laughs> there's, there, there's a way that they show us what's most important to us. I think, um, there's a lot of theories about why we dream and, and some of the things that I feel like are, are, um, seem really true is that when we're sleeping, we're processing emotion that dreams are very implicated in our emotional life and trying to, um, kind of work through emotion and, and, and temper it. And that, um, so dreams of reflect what's really, uh, gotten a big response from us. And the reason that they're abstract, as you say, or obscure, I don't seem to make sense is that when we're dreaming, our prefrontal cortex, our, our rational thinking function is very damped down and our, our ability to express things in clear language and a logical order and our time, our sense of time, all that stuff is sleeping. And so including our ability to remember things really well and our ability to, you know, executive functioning isn't, doesn't exist very much in dreams, but what, what is still very um, uh, awake in our brains is our, our, our limbic system, our emotional center, our visual, our visual cortex, we can picture emotions basically. Mm -hmm. So we get the, the dreams are not trying to be obscure. They're just expressing themselves in what's the language that's available to them. So, and this is an idea from a very famous dream researcher named Ernest Hartman. Well, the, the person whose name the award was, uh, was, was named after. And he said that dreams are picture metaphors for the most prevalent emotion that we're sensing. And so if you, if you see them as that, they, they, a lot of them really make sense immediately. Mm -hmm. they're, they're, they're pictures of what we feel. And so in terms of therapy, if you're wanting to um, get an image for something that's really important and really uh, up for you, the dreams supply that. And they often supply images of things that we maybe don't want to think about or don't want to talk about. They, they, they picture things that we repress. So they're very important uh, um, material for the therapy process. And I, I can give you an example, and I often share this one because it, my, my, my daughter is willing to share it, and I don't like sharing client stories too much. Um, but this one, she, um, she says, you know, you can use this as an example. So, so um, she dreamt of a, um, of a, a horrific image of, of hacking a woman to pieces. And she called me because this was really disturbing to her, and she knows I you know a few things about nightmares. And so... Um, what you do with an image like that is not take it literally. I always tell people not to take your, um, especially graphic dreams like that, literally, because dreams are just trying to get your attention. And sometimes that's the way they get your attention is to make it very um, gory. And uh, especially if it's important. So, but I did ask her something about a question about what it, you know, does it mean something to be, um, to be divided up in pieces? Does it mean something to you to be, broken or, or, you know, divided. And she immediately had a, um, a, a, a deep response to that. Yes. You know, living in, she was going to school in Montreal and she was confined to the, her apartment for uh, a month and couldn't get outside. And she felt like a big part of her, we were from the West coast and she felt like she couldn't, like a big part of herself was left back there and she felt profoundly divided and she felt really uncomfortable. And the dream was a way of saying this is important to pay attention to. And she made some life changes that really helped. And so that's a, a, a good example. Mm -hmm. of so what, what's what I think is important there. One of the things is that you, your question was to her, right? What does it feel like to be d divided? It wasn't, well, how does it feel like hacking up somebody? Right. So mm -hmm. to, our dreams, I, I, I don't want to use the word always, but oftentimes what's going on for us Right. So she was she was hacking up somebody. Well, she wasn't hacking up herself. Yeah. Uh, well, this is an idea from Gestalt um, that every aspect of the dream, everything in the dream is an aspect of ourselves. And the that I don't know if that's entirely true. I do think that dreaming can be about something larger than ourselves. But I would say that the characters in the dream 
like we're not just the um, the dream ego, the av- our avatar in the dream. That's not um, that's not the only aspect of us or that represents us in the dream. I think we tend to over identify with the dream ego, and I think the dream ego really represents our persona or just mm-hmm. an aspect of ourselves that we show to the world. And it's often an uncomfortable figure in our dreams or an incompetent figure. But there are other characters in the dream I think that do represent different ways of looking at the situation or different aspects of our consciousness and that really it's it's mostly very um expanding and and enlarging to imagine into the other other characters and the other pieces of the dream i think they have a lot more novelty and a lot more uh, to offer in in ways that are enlightening new you know when you talked about uh earlier on in, in as we were talking you talked about uh uh, kind of the how how dream work was was viewed and how often sometimes it's it's perceived as obscure, but you know as we're talking here, uh, part of me is thinking, well, a lot of this is uh, and correct me if I'm wrong again, but is is interpretation, right? And that's so. Talk to us about how does one learn how to interpret are there many ways to interpret dreams and so forth yes um there are although uh i did this uh, another study i like to, i like to do research i guess but on um what you know what are the most common modern dream work methods and really the whole field has gotten away from interpretation in um the dream worker as expert and i'll tell you what your dream means to more of an experiential and collaborative approach so what um, what I do and what I think most of the dream um, dream therapists that I that I speak to do is really uh, invite the dreamer to go back into and experience the dream, experience it from different perspectives, feel into how it might be um, inviting them to look at a different perspective. It usually enlarges your perspective or kind of gives you a a view from left field or from something that you wouldn't have considered. But then the dreamer is the one who offers the, and I wouldn't even say interpretation so much as the dreamer would then take the dream and uh, live it forward or ask a question like, what's this dream asking of me? What is this dream trying to show me? How is this dream, um, you know, attempting to enlarge my perspective here? And, Mm -hmm. and if you, if you enter a dream experientially, which is, is pretty easy to do because there's such a, a, um, there's such an all encompassing experience when you have them, they feel so real. So What I find is that when you invite the dreamer to try on different places besides the dream ego, they will, they'll get their own uh, sense of what the dream is about. And as the outsider, I don't really feel like we're qualified, honestly, to tell Mm -hmm. someone what their dream image means. I think that particular way of working with dreams is quite outdated, like the dream dictionary and a a dog means this or a horse. It's like, (laughs) it's not really, there's no universal um, meaning in dreams because everybody, everyone has a different, you know, say someone could love dogs and someone could be terrified of them. So my dog and your dog in a dream are going to be very different, but a person's emotional experience or what what the feeling tone is in the dream and how that might be familiar is a really um, generative way to get at what the mm-hmm. dream is, is is saying or trying to do it's interesting as, as we're talking um, i can't help but think about and I almost feel what my uh experience was like working with that therapist and and doing the it was so friggin intense and i remember she told me you know this is gonna get intense and it did it got so in why is it so intense well maybe you're intense <laughs> <laughs> maybe that's true but i think i mean no, I think, I you know dreams in, in and of themselves they're so I mean, when you go in there they're so intense Be- well i think it's because they they use emotion as their base material and so um there is an intensity to that and they really go to they cut to the chase they go mm. to the most um 
They, I think they really are trying to metabolize the things that have had the most impact on us. Like my initial dreams that I worked with, and I, I did um, uh, therapy with a Jungian as well. And my dreams after we started in on the process were about, like I was uh, born very premature and nearly died when I was born. I had to spend a couple months in the hospital. And then I also nearly died when I was 17 and um, river. And I had a dream that combined my, my early birth experience with this near drowning. So the two experiences in my life where I was near, I nearly died and put them Mm -hmm. together into one. So speak of intensity and, and yeah, the dreams, I mean, that experience, I kind of, you know, put it away somewhere and thought, Oh, I'm good. But you know what, obviously it's got a big impact, something like Mm -hmm. that. And so my dreams, um, felt like, oh, this is a this is I've got an opportunity to metabolize this a little bit, and I'm going to bring this up to the surface. And I'm going to give you an image, and and it did feel like one of the most profound experiences of my life. But at the time, I didn't know what to do with it, so it was very helpful to uh, to to process the emotions later. And I mean, I think that's what dreams do: is they bring up unmetabolized feelings, and mm-hmm. by their nature, they're often intense. I just want to remind everyone that I'm speaking with Dr. Leslie Ellis. So do you, how do you work? Do you work exclusively with dreams? Who comes to you? Yeah. So I mainly now do nightmare um, consultations. So I work with people who have intense nightmares or, but more often I'm actually teaching therapists how to work with dreams and they consult with me on their clients because I, um, to parachute in, um, is, you know, there isn't the relationship developed and I'm, you know, not doing so much one-on-one therapy anymore, but mostly teaching how to work with dreams and nightmares and in a, a particular way that, that is quite simple actually to learn. I'm really trying to encourage therapists, even if they don't work with dreams per se to, Mm -hmm. to work with nightmares if people have them because they're quite treatable and they're, they're quite a, they can be quite a clinical problem. They're very highly linked to suicide risk and Mm. they uh, disrupt sleep. So they create a lot of problems for people. So mainly that's what I'm doing now is teaching therapists how to work with dreams. And also I have a specialty in teaching um, nightmare treatment. So therapists are going to be listening to this and they're going to be like, oh my God, this sounds awesome. Dr. Ellis sounds amazing, but I don't know the first thing about dreams, blah, blah, blah. What would you say to them? I always say something to the effect of, if you're a therapist, you already have the tools that you need to work with dreams because you mainly need to be curious and empathic and calm in the face of um, whatever comes your way. And the other thing uh, is that dreams, I really believe they're attempting to metabolize emotion. They're, they're meant to be helpful. They're not trying to be difficult. And there are some specific things about nightmares. Um, like one thing that's useful to know is that nightmares are a classic symptom of PTSD. Uh, and they will show you by the nature of the dream um, kind of their diagnostic. They can show you how far the trauma has been metabolized because mm. the closer a dream is to the actual event, the less it's been metabolized. And the more the dream starts to become symbolic and um, more of a picture metaphor, weaving in current time and current events, the more sort of actually dreamlike it is, the more you can say that they've gotten a certain level of integration of their trauma. And you can, you can, kind of track their dream content and see how well they're doing mm. and to to treat them you're essentially letting them dream the dream onward it's not very complicated so i i guess i want to say if there's a perception that dream work has to be really complicated and esoteric it doesn't it can mm-hmm. be very simple and it can go obviously very deep and and get into all kinds of terrain but it, it doesn't have to be that way it can still be something like a part of what you do um, that isn't so complicated. You know, what's coming up for me is uh, uh, the more and more popular use of uh, like psilocybin and and, and psychedelics. Um, and I'm wondering what your thoughts are on the relationship 
the the commonalities, if any, there exists between working with those? Yeah, I think there is um, some crossover in that in that um, you know you get into in the psilocybin uh, journeys into an altered state uh, where there's definitely more that can come up from um, the unconscious, if you want. I don't like that word. It sounds like you're knocked out or asleep, Mm -hmm. but from the implicit, from, from the, 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 you know, under underworld. And so you're dealing with um, kind of bigger forces and there is a way that I think that they touch on the same material and in the dreaming state, you're also, your ego is kind of relativized and you're like not in control. So like a lot of, a lot of wild things can happen in dreams as well. Um, and then there's some differences in that, you know, with, with psychedelics, it's, it's a, it's a deliberate kind of journey into that, um, that other realm. And it's, it's, it's not something your body would naturally do. So Mm -hmm. it's, it's a little bit more of a intensified and, um, you know, I, I feel like it has to be, has to be, you know, used carefully. And I've heard incredible stories about how it can help. Um, but, um, dreaming is just a, it's a more of a natural, um, a natural trip of the same variety in a way, not, and not doesn't have the same intensity usually. And it's more about what your own body will, um, will offer you. Usually dreaming is paced at a, in, in a way that you can metabolize it though. Not always depending on, you know, somebody's, um, encountered, things that jog their memory or, 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 um, upset their uh, nervous system. The dreams can get intense, whether you like it or not, but there is definitely some crossover. I, I feel like, um, they have, um, you know, a certain amount of terrain in common and yeah, they can open up, open up realms that you wouldn't necessarily look at otherwise. Uh, what do you say when people say, I, I, don't, I don't dream, I'm sorry, I don't have dreams. <laughs> <laughs> well, everybody dreams um, roughly two hours and 90 minutes to two hours every night. This is, wow. um, it's just that they don't rem- remember their dreams. And so that uh, is fairly common, I would say, especially as you, as, as we get older, uh, dream, dream recall is, it kind of um, dissipates a little bit. But like you discovered, when you started to pay attention to your dreams and use them in therapy and and really engage with them, you had more dreams and more intense dreams and remembered them better, right? So I I think there's there's a number of ways to catch your dreams if you want to remember them. But everybody dreams, and it is possible to recall them if you if you really want to if you pay attention to them. Awesome. All right, Leslie. Um, so what's the best way for people to get in contact with you. Well, hold on, hold on, hold on. Before you do that, um, the book is called The Clinician's Guide to Dream Therapy, Implementing Simple and Effective Dream Work. We'll have that linked up here at the show notes page at thetraumatherapistpodcast.com. Now, just quickly before we kind of close out here, um, obviously it's for clinicians, Mm-hmm. Okay, <laughs> hence the title. But, yeah, although um, it's it's not like it's not really uh, the the language is accessible. Anybody could read it. Honestly, it's 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 aimed at clinicians, but it's friendly. Okay, awesome, mm-hmm. awesome, and that people can get that anywhere when books yep. are sold. Okay, um, all right. Where, what's the best way for people to get in contact with you and learn about what you're doing? Probably my website would be the simplest. It's got everything that I'm doing, and and um, some actually some. Uh, material for people who are non-clinicians, but a lot of stuff for clinicians and I, um, all the podcasts I've done. I think the original one that we did together is, is still up there and uh, um, lots of free resources, blog posts. It's, it's really, yeah, it's, it's, it's the place it's Dr. Leslie Ellis.com. You can okay. maybe throw it on the link, but it's, yeah, it's definitely, it's the place to start. And okay. there's a, there's a way to reach me through the website as well. Okay. And finally, so you offer courses for clinicians. Are these in person, online, both? What? They're online at the moment. I'm thinking now maybe I could start offering some in person, but um, it's been, you know, as as we've all been through COVID, everything moved online and it's a pretty accessible way to, to reach a lot of different places and people. So right now, yeah, it's all online, but 
hopefully we'll get to see some warm bodies in our room at some point in the next little while. Awesome. Awesome. Well, I appreciate it, Leslie. Great talking to you. I'm so glad I, you, you came back on here. I just, I just love talking to you. Um, thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you too. I really appreciate the opportunity to talk to you. It's always a pleasure. All right. Take care. Okay. Okay.